हेलो प्रोफेसर दत्ता यस यस मोस्ट वेलकम ओके ग्रेट ग्रेट टू सी यू ओके good afternoon ladies and gentlemen uh, it gives me immense pleasure to welcome you back to the day 3 of 15th all india conference of china studies organized by the institute of chinese studies new delhi and the indian institute of technology guwahati in cooperation with guwahati university and omio kumar das institute of social change and development in partnership with the india office conrad adinoyer stiftung this is the last thematic session and the theme of this panel is chinese discourses and praxis we are honored to have professor akhil ranjan datta as the chair for this session dr datta is a professor at the department of political science guwahati university we are glad to have dr sonika gupta and dr hemant adlaka as the discussions for this session dr sonika serves as an associate professor of global politics department of humanities and social sciences indian institute of technology madras chennai Dr. Hemant Adlakha is an associate professor, Center for Chinese and Southeast Asian Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. He is also the vice chairperson and honorary fellow of Institute of Chinese Studies, New Delhi. We have three speakers for this panel. Our first speaker is Priyanka Keshri, doctoral candidate, Center for Chinese and Southeast Asian Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. She will be speaking on RQ RQism in China's IR discourses. focus on india our second speaker is cherry hitkari she is a student of pg intensive advanced diploma in chinese language department of east asian studies university of delhi she will be speaking on rocking the cradle ruling the world crafting the ideal citizen through children's songs in the people's republic of china our last speaker for this session is pralhad kumar singh doctoral candidate center for east asian studies jawaharlal nehru university new delhi he will be speaking on civil military uh, military civil fusion in china a case study under the xi jinping era you can find the detailed bio of all our speakers discussants and the chair in the brochure provided in the chat box now before i invite professor datta to begin the proceedings let me lay out a few housekeeping rules all participants expect the speakers will be muted for the duration of this event and participants are requested to send in their queries via the chat box or use the raise hand option please unmute yourself only when called upon to do so since this is the last thematic panel i would also request the speakers to please stick to their time limit of 15 to 18 minutes i will be giving a reminder and do the time keeping i'll now invite the chair to begin the proceedings over to you sir thank you so much it's it's indeed a great pleasure to be here as the chair of this last thematic panel uh discourse and praxis discourses and praxis uh being pursued by uh the countries regimes uh focusing on both china and india uh you know i'll not take time uh you know at the later and later part of it i'll give some comments because uh, the chair is allotted maximum 5 minutes so i don't want to waste this uh, my time right at this moment so i welcome you all the speakers and also the discussants now i invite priyanka kesri to make her presentation and the time has been given and i request you to be uh, you know to confine yourself to the allotted time over to you priyanka thank you sir uh, good afternoon uh, good afternoon uh, first of all i would like to thank uh, ics and uh, the convener sabri ma'am uh, to giving me such an opportunity to present my paper uh, good afternoon chair akhil ranjan sir discussion sonika ma'am himan sir other speakers and all the participants and the host and co-host uh, my topic for today's presentation is aq aqism in china's international relations discourse focus on india so uh my research question for today's uh, paper is why chinese competitors are using aq aqism in uh, or a spiritual victory method in the context of india and how what is the significance of this aq aqism in ir discourse the discussion becomes more relevant as president donald trump 
mentions about Lucius Aquu, and I quote: uh, "The spirit of Lucius Aquu is more alive and well in China." So, discussing this uh, is becomes more relevant, and the many Chinese competitors are using this uh, Aquu Aquism spiritual victory method in the context of India-China relation. So, let's get into uh, who is Aquu, and where did this Aquism come from? Aqiu is a protagonist in the novella The True Story of Aqiu Aqiu Changchuan which was written by very famous writer Lu Sun The caricature Aqiu used to post privately to someone who is weaker to him but he used to be very submissive and meek who uh, who was powerful or superior to him Aqiu basically means being ignorant bullied and beaten whereas aquism means deceiving yourself by deceiving others and letting them know that you are victorious failing to realize your fault and then glorifying them in recent uh, there are many chinese communities are using the term aqu aquism in the context of india china in the context of recent india china border clashes especially after the abrogation of article 370 35a in jammu and kashmir the terminology of spiritual victory method is used for india only is used for india only by the chinese competitors but not for others country that is uh, need to be focused the use of this kind of terminology or expression like uh, china is using this uh, spiritual victory method for india and uh, they in the same way china are using other terminology or expression for other countries like they are using this kha cho chuchen uh, meaning a silly solution or tung ko xian sang mr wolf Uh, which is used to describe us anti china policies under trump biden administration respectively so let's get into the true story of aq like this was first published in a uh, uh, some background of true story of aq this was first published in the uh, chanbao newspaper uh, from peking uh, in december 21 this is a short satirical novel uh, which is like earlier lucian used to uh, use uh, wrote this story to show the psyche of the chinese uh, people at that time later on uh, like china has stopped using uh, this chinese psyche or aq for uh, for themselves but they have started using this uh, for the other country so uh, uh, one of the western scholars also uh, quote like this uh, uh, why uh, chinese are telling this uh, aqu aquism or a spiritual victory in the context of india china border con conflict uh, like china is uh, india is behaving like aqu and one of the western scholar also added this and i quote said that the abrogation of article 370 does not alter any ground reality along lsc and loc also uh, some chinese competitors are saying that in recent clashes between india and china there was a loss of india whether in terms of soldier or territory but india like aq is behaving being ignorant and deceiving herself by spiritual victory method so many chinese competitors uh, and analyst have placed that uh, many foreign and domestic decision taken by modi uh, in recent uh, in india like demonetization gst doklam and kashmir as aq and aquism uh, we, we need to understand uh, like why china uh, is using this uh, uh, like aq in the 20th century uh, like uh, this invention aq is uh, not new uh, uh, in the 20th century by lucin it is very still very relevant like uh, uh, like in in a article in uh, written in chinese on 26th october there was a commentary by chinese uh, uh, writer like aq ching shen shangli shangli fa in to thong chu in go meaning like which is translated as aqu's spiritual victory method india ruled britain this was in the context of uh, recent appointment of rishi sunak as the president uh, prime minister of uk so uh, like uh, there was another uh, commentary uh, by uh, in, in chinese in to ren tang shang in go shao xiang chun yu pao chuo la in to aqu ye pushao which which is translated as india finally got their revenge when they became british prime minister and there are many indian aq 
in uh, in this con context uh, uh, like uh, there were so many articles which i would like to quote from the articles like uh, in this uh, like krishi sonak uh, is not uh, a uh, from india but uh, we are taking proud of like he is from india and he uh, the british has ruled us uh, for so many years now somebody is ruling them so in this context the chinese uh, competitors are telling that indians are uh, naturally proficient in a spiritual victory method which was proposed by mr lusun so in that uh, context also chinese competitors are telling uh, that we are uh, behaving like aq so uh, uh, this uh, eco, uh, based on this we have to think why chinese are using this and uh, need to contextualize this things uh, and uh, understand the mindset mindset through the lusun uh, through the aq character how chinese are thinking about us and how we need to uh, uh, put it like we need to understand it through the character so in the last uh, i would uh, left the floor open for discussion like uh, this aq accusum and a special victim method especially for india why for india so uh, we need to open it uh, Uh, we need to think over it and and in the last uh, i would just like to uh, like uh, through the ppt so uh, recently in the doklam issue like they are also using uh, this uh, india as a spiritual victory method in doklam also uh, and in economy also like uh, their uh, india's uh, economy is uh, chinese competitors i am not telling this of my own like the chinese competitors telling like in recent times india's economy has been very awful uh, but modi government is diverting the issue with the other issue like revocation of article 37035a uh, in jammu and kashmir so uh, like the, uh, the real situation in jammu and kashmir is not being uh, changed is not getting changed so uh, this is uh, like the spiritual victory method and in recent also rishi suna case like uh, uh, in the story uh, we have uh, seen uh, this uh, uh, mr chao uh, like when he passed the imperial examination so he uh, the aq told like he belongs to my clan so i mean, after that he was uh, beaten or like he was like uh, trying to console himself with the spiritual method so in this context uh, china uh, i've just quoted uh, one of the chinese writers recently in uh, october it wrote an article which said uh, like rishi sunak is not from indian origin but he has been compared uh, as the same like akio used to say like he belongs to the same clan so we indians are claiming that he belongs to the india that's all uh, for today's presentation and uh, thank you okay uh, thank you very much uh, priyanka i think priyanka has written a very comprehensive paper very extensive paper it's around 10000 words paper but uh, she has given a very gist of it and we'll have opportunities for having uh, in a very comprehensive discussion on it uh therefore i now look forward to the second presentation which will be made by seri hitkari uh, again another very interesting paper they titled rocking the cradle uh, ruling the world and of course she has a subtitle now over to seri hitkari thank you sir Good afternoon to one and all present here today. I, Cherry Kari, will be presenting my paper titled "Rocking the Cradle, Ruling the World: Crafting the Ideal Citizen Through Children's Songs in the People's Republic of China." The hand that rocks the cradle is the hand that rules the world. This line perfectly captures nation-states' attempts to control primary school education so as to craft generations of obedient citizens. The aim of this paper is to map the changing notions of an ideal citizen vis-a-vis -vis socio-economic changes in the PRC through a study of children's songs taught as a part of preschool and primary school curriculum, and through them understand the CCP's threat perceptions and aspirations. The study spans over seventy-two years of CCP's rule from nineteen forty-nine to twenty twenty-one. That is from Mao to Xi Jinping. These are my sources. The question arises: Why children's songs? 
because children are potent representatives of dissatis uh, dissatisfaction with the past and present and the desire for change in the future. Children's songs in China are thus representative of the ideal citizen that the communist state intends to raise and aid in manufacturing consent for the party's rule. Musical genres play a crucial role in the constitution, expression, and negotiation of identity through the evocation of personal experiences of the listeners. In a social setting, music can not only entice emotions of happiness, pleasure, and anger, but also influence group formation, because of which it has been effectively used as a political tool of mind control since ancient times. China, for instance, has a long tradition of didactic understanding of music. The Huichi for uh, claims music as a tool to unify the people and maintain order. Such a notion continues in communist China. Through a thematic study of children's songs, I intend to locate the ideal citizen in China at the juncture of political themes and behavioral traits that these songs emphasize, as well as a broader socioeconomic context, both domestic and international, that forms a backdrop of their formulation. Benedict Anderson defined nations as imagined political communities, which are bound by a sense of collective belonging through shared experiences understood as collective memory. At its core is the process of subjectivity's formation, which marks the transformation of an individual into a citizen, best defined in the works of Michel Foucault and Louis Althusser. Foucault defines individual subjectivities as formed through three ways. First, status of sciences, such as categories of men and women. Second, objectivizing through dividing practices, such as good and evil. And third, how humans define themselves, that is sexuality. So Foucault argues that individual subjectivities are formed through power exertion by one force over another, for instance, between the state and citizens, and through which the former, and I quote, categorizes the individual, marks him by his own identity, individuality, attaches him to his own identity, imposes a law of truth on him, which he must recognize and which others have to recognize him. Althusser similarly claims that all states rely on the dual use of violence and ideology to craft individual subjectivities. While the dominant use of the first creates a primarily repressive state apparatus or RSA, that of the latter creates the ideological state apparatus or ISA. While the RSA is unified and functions primarily in the public domain, the ISA exists in a plurality of forms penetrating to the private domains of individuals, for instance, education, without controlling which power cannot be held for long. Althusser defines interpolation as the ideological construction of an individual's identity through institutions of authority like state or religion, which closely works to manufacture consent and conformity in favor of a particular regime through an elaborate process as seen here, where the individuals adopt and internalize an identity imposed on them by the state. With the exception of a few non-conforming quote-unquote bad subjects to be policed by the RSA, the majority of the subjects work all by themselves. Unlike Western liberal democracies, the Chinese notion of citizenship has historically been perceived as an economic, social, and cultural benefit granted by the state to the people born in the nation devoid of civil rights. Hence, the idea is to raise the cultural standard and quality or suture of citizens through their participation in state-directed nation-building programs. Suture thus dominates the public discourse in China, deliberating what constitutes an ideal citizen and what is to be done with those who refuse to conform. The blueprint for the ideal citizen came from the Soviet Union, where the citizen was envisaged as a duty-bound cog in the state machinery, significant yet dependent, the quote-unquote millionth part of the all-powerful state. Three terms used for subjects in China further clarify this nature, people, runmen, nationals, kuomen, and the least significant term citizens, or kongmen, uh, as can be seen from this passage by Michael Keane. While kuomen is self-explanatory, it is runmen, or people, a politically loaded term used to define the revolutionary classes, which gains the most prominence. Unlike the people, what constitutes citizen is fixed and remained virtually insignificant till the 1980s. In the Soviet Union, as later adopted in China, children were initially celebrated for their innate rebelliousness, which was seen as a characteristic of a true revolutionary. However, economic priorities and concerns of state building forced a change of plans and soon children came to be viewed as tabula rasa, that is, red childhood was not natural but had to be constructed through social conditioning by the state. Uh, now let's turn to uh, a thematic analysis of children's songs. First under consideration is Mao's China. Post-establishment of the PRC, 
Mao faced the twin challenges of carrying forward the revolutionary spirit while developing and unifying a country that lay in ruins of war for more than a century, for which building loyalties towards both the newborn nation and the Communist Party was extremely important. It was naturally the high malleability of children's minds that attracted the CCP, and within a decade from 1949, primary school enrollment increased 370%. In his Yanan talks, Mao emphasized on the need to use literature and art as a tool to further the ideas of the revolution. Such, such ideas reappear in his talk to music workers. The most conspicuous theme is inculcating the love for Mao and the CCP. The best song to consider here is Tung Fang Hong or East is Red. As can be seen, the song celebrates Mao as a savior of the people and explicitly states the people are liberated wherever the Communist Party exists. Another purpose of children's songs was to build a perception of a successful state policy, such as the Cultural Revolution in this song. Economy forms another theme. Mao prioritized self-reliance, which intensified as the rift with the USSR widened and, a hope, and hope for any aid diminished. Each commune was expected to not just contribute to agrarian and industrial production, provide surplus to the state and build the basic infrastructure, but also to arm the military. These six songs here encourage children to take up revolutionary professions, also reflecting on Mao's abhorrence of intellectuals. This is a very interesting song, which is completely in congruence with the Soviet notion of an ideal citizen being a cog in the state machinery. For Mao, following Lenin, the military was not isolated from the civilians, but one integrated within them. Every individual hence had to possess militaristic characteristics. Here, militancy and obedience to Mao has been emphasized upon. Though nationalism does not occur in its own right, certain themes such as the question of reunification with Taiwan do appear as seen on the left. On the right are three songs which craft a superfluous willingness of the ethnic minorities to demand a communist rule. Reflections of foreign policy can also be seen in children's songs. In line with Mao's three worlds theory, the song Calling on the Telephone calls for building an alliance among third world nations to defeat the enemies of the revolution. Similarly, these songs emphasize on building close alliances with fellow communist nations. So what threats and aspirations can we prize out there? Among challenges, foremost for internal opposition within the party and from enemy classes, external conflicts with powers like the US, legitimacy crisis linked to economic issues, and maintaining unity. Aspirations include building a communist utopia and elevating Mao to a position commanding unquestionable loyalty. Who then was Mao's ideal citizen? The one who is ideologically correct, technologically creative, hardworking and self-reliant, militant, proletarian and owes unquestionable loyalty to Mao and the CCP. After Mao's death, Tang Xiaoping was faced with a major task of diluting extremism and restarting the political and economic system, which had remained virtually paralyzed for a decade during the Cultural Revolution. Tang called for discipline and inculcation of a scientific attitude among children, rather than aggressively emphasizing on ideology, even as love for the country, the party and socialism continued to be emphasized. It was, however, after the Tiananmen Square movement in 1989 and in disintegration of the USSR in 1991, which produced a severe legitimacy crisis for the party state. The void was filled with nationalism linked to the Communist Party. As a result, the party launched a nationwide patriotic education campaign in 1991, and in 1995, the Ministry of Education passed the 3100 Patriotic Education Curriculum Order, including a list of songs to be taught. This song here emphasizes on the love for the CCP, celebrating both the revolutionary classes and Mao. Uh, nationalism, as discussed, dominated the discourse. The song Kiss the Sun emphasizes on the greatness of the Chinese nation. Songs emphasizing on national unity, such as the one here, gained more relevance. An interesting feature of this song is the use of the term Shancho or divine land, uh, an ancient term used for China, which portrays a greater acceptance of the past in stepping away from the radicalism that colored social life under Mao. Songs highlighting China's economic development, such as the Three Gorges Dam, were included to paint a glorious picture of the party's rule. Another theme which appears in the attempt to combat individualism, uh, a product of both the one-child policy and opening up with songs emphasizing on collective good over individual interests, such as Little Girl Picking the Mushrooms. The challenges that the CCP, uh, CCP identified during uh, this phase are diluting ideological chaos, securing support for economic liberalization, achieving economic growth and recrafting the party's raison d'etre, uh, countering growing individualism, maintaining social cohesion and national integration. Aspirations, aspirations include putting China at par with advanced nations as well as building a united and stable nation conducive for economic growth. Firm nationalism, prevalence of rationality over ideology, 
robustness, morality, and ethics entered the discourse. At the turn of the century, Hu Jintao faced major challenges both at home and abroad. While economic rise at home resulted in growing corruption and malice, threatening parties' legitimacy and social order, China's global rise fueled suspicions about its intentions internationally. The solution was sought in reinstalling Confucian ethos that entered music education, not only representing China's rich heritage in an attempt to enhance its global image as a harmonious society, but to also reinstate the lost morality among the populace. The 2008 Beijing Olympics served as a perfect moment to further these ideas. The opening ceremony saw a nine-year-old girl singing Ode to the Motherland, which affirms both nationalism and unity of ethnicities, as these lyrics show. The theme song of the Olympics, War Her Knee, uh, highlighted the uh, notion of global fraternity. Folk songs from across the world emphasizing on the love for nature and virtues like kindness were included, uh, included in the Ministry of Education prescribed music textbook in UA. Some of the songs were Red River Valley from Canada, Beautiful Village from Italy, among others. Popular songs such as Louis Armstrong's What a Wonderful World, John Denver's Take Me Home, Country Roads, etc. were also included. New challenges that the CCP faced during this period were to counter the China threat theories and build an amiable image as well as to check corruption and social degradation at home. While the aspirations included expanding China's soft power globally and building a harmonious society conducive to global multiculturalism. New traits of the ideal citizen during this period were being a so soft power representative of China, appreciative of cultural diversity, rooted in Confucian ethos and being open-minded and receptive to global influence. Now to the present era. In his 2012, the Road to Rejuvenation speech presenting the Chinese dream, she linked individual destinies to that of the nation, emphasizing on staunch nationalism. With the aim of attaining a leadership role for China, she seeks to inculcate a blend of Confucian and socialist ethos among the citizens, best reflected in the music textbook of the young pioneers, which almost all primary school children are a part of. Many songs such as Our Dream draw a parallel between individual dreams and the national dream of, of building a powerful country. An interesting feature here is the constant emphasis on the century of humiliation, which is used to incite the population to swirl into action and strive for a better future. Several songs inspire children to dream big and contribute to China's development, such as I am a small astronaut. Similarly, the song Chinese Dream Flying Field highlights China's prosperity as a result of the party's dedication and sincerity, as do songs The Sun Shines on UNV and Shishwang Panna has changed a lot. Ethnic minorities and national integration appear as a more conspicuous theme, as can be seen uh, through these examples. The concern is assimilation to LA prejudices and portray national unity as a collective duty. Historical personalities recurrently appear as inspiring figures such as Hua Mulan, Hai Rue, Confucius, Mencius, and Han Peitzer, as well as the Yellow Emperor. The song Whom Should I Vote For reflects Xi's anti-corruption drive. It narrates the story of a class election in a primary school where one of the candidates, Tang Tang, tries to secretly bribe a classmate with a bag of candies in exchange for his vote. The classmate returns the candies to Tang Tang and votes for the other candidate acting in a just way. This song here clearly defines what freedom means to she. It narrates the story of a goldfish, which in its quest for freedom jumps out of the fish tank when the child refuses to let it out. Seeing it struggling for life, the child puts it back in the fish tank. The song emphasizes freedom is not foolishness. Another song, Rules and Freedom, clearly draws an indispensable link between regulations and freedom. Global integration appears as a major theme. The song Children of the World Share a Single Family lays a similar emphasis on global fraternity as songs during the Hu era. However, a very interesting difference is the use of the politically loaded term Tianxia, emphasizing on a China-centric world order where Beijing plays a dominant role instead of the more benign term Shi Shang or in the world as used uh, during uh, Hu Jintao's period. Such a use is indicative of Xi's attempts to vouch for a leadership status for China. Foremost challenges for the CCP today are corruption, environmental degradation, maintaining social cohesion and national integration, as well as Western liberal ideas of freedom and individualism. Concurrently, the party's aspirations include preparing China as a global leader, achieving complete uni unification and securing Xi's position to unquestionable authority. The ideal citizen is thus the one who holds unquestionable loyalty and love for the party and Xi, is a staunch nationalist, one rooted in Confucian ethos, heavily imbued with socialism, is hardworking, righteous, and has a heightened pride in China's past, and is ready for China's enhanced leadership role at the global front. To conclude, the state-citizen relationship in China tips the balance in favor of the former, made possible through behavior modeling and ideological control, where children's songs play a major role. 
children have thus been intrinsic to the nature of Chinese nationalism by representing a malleable force capable of transforming the degenerate society into a new order. These songs are also reflective of the CCP's threat perceptions and aspirations, and hence indicate China's future trajectory and internal dynamics. Thus, while coercion stands with its limitations in putting off the sparks before they break into prairie fires, it is the party state's ability to rock the cradle to and fro while keeping the pace under its command that predominantly sustains the CCP's rule. Thank you. Okay, uh, I believe Professor Datta has become disconnected and he's trying to connect back in. So I think our next presentation can begin meanwhile. Mr. Pralad, you could go ahead. Thank you. Am I only one? Hello. Yes, please. Yes. Uh, so my uh, good afternoon, everyone, and thanks, Chair. Uh, my topic is uh, military civil fusion in China, a case study of uh, case study under Xi Jinping's era. So the. Uh, Civil military relations aims to understand the dynamics of relationship between civilian and civilian government and military in any society. For the democratic system, it is largely dominated by the debate on objective control and subjective control, wherein objective control seeks to only gives uh, direction to the military and not how to do. But in subjective control, you also direct military at the operational level, and uh, there is much more political in interference in the uh, military domain. But in, in the case of China, uh, military plays a uh, dominant role in political sphere, as David Samu talks about symbiotic relationship between party and military in China, where both are uh, dependent on each other for their survival and state power. So uh, theoretical debates on the civil military relationship in China is majorly focuses on debates between pol professionalism and political role, where uh, scholars uh, debates like whether professionalism uh, decreases political role or uh, whether professionalism in Chinese military is inconsistent with the political role of Chinese military, whether there is institutional separations or not, or, or how modernization is impacting uh, the leadership uh, or how modernization or leadership changes is impacting the uh, role of military in China. So majorly theoretical debates on civil military relationship in uh, uh, China revolves around this. So uh, historically leadership played a crucial role in uh, like uh, crucial role in setting priorities and uh, centralized political structure help like uh, setting priorities for the military. So in this paper, uh, this paper aims to understand the civil military integ integration in uh, historical context, because whenever uh, we uh, come across some opinion piece about military civ civil fusion, it is uh, seen as something very new. Uh, Xi Jinping's uh, 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 Xi Jinping's new uh, experiment, and with uh, through historical uh, background, the, this paper tries to understand military civil fusion and its evolution over the period. So for that purpose, this will first uh, define the civil military integration. Then we'll talk about military civil fusion and uh, different notions associated with this. So civil military uh, integration. So in the sense of immediate military uh, threat uh, and considering the budgetary constraints, uh, US lawmakers emphasized on civil military uh, integration and US Congress directed their Office of Techno Technology assist to provide uh, uh, a report on the prospect for milit uh, civil military integration. OTA presented paper on assessing the potential of uh, uh, civil military integration uh, in uh, 1994. And um, in that report, uh, uh, civil military integration as a process of integration, defense and commercial in the uh, industrial basis. So civil military integration aims for uh, commercial and military sec sector to share their technology, personnel, and facilities, 
and the major approach for civil military integration includes spin off in that government promotes the civilian application of military research in that like uh, uh, civilian sector have to uh, uh, military sectors uh, 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 we get, civilian sector gets benefit of military research in the spin in approach like civilian technology is used for the military purpose there is another approach is welfare and warfare where both mutual uh, uh, there is mutual interaction takes place between uh, uh, civilian and military sector. In the dual use approach, uh, they share uh, knowledge pool and civilian and military sector. And in, in civil military integration, civilian sector take lead leading role in the military uh, military research. So, civil military uh, integrations evolve in China from uh, from idea of uh, chunmin jeha to uh, military civil fusion chunmin rongha so the idea of military civil fusion has been uh, present in china uh, for some or other from uh, from a long time so term the chun and term min constitute two building block for civil and military and it acquires different notion according to their priority in the Mao's period, the idea was centered around uh, considerate, considerate approach like public-private balance. So the idea was Chunming Chiangu. So the uh, Mao was giving uh, priority to, um, Mao was adopting a balancing approach to military and people. Uh, during Tang era, the, uh, the uh, idea shifted to Chunming Chiaha. So as a, a guiding principle of military civil integration, in this, he promoted the uh, def defense construction uh, and national economy, and in that he promoted the commercialization of defense economy. During uh, Jiang Zemin, uh, he promoted human, which means that locating the military potential in the civilian capability. Uh, the Hu Jintao's period uh, that Jia uh, shifted to the Rongha, which means for like from combination to fusion. So the idea uh, started from the combining military and civil, uh, civilian sector, and it uh, evolved till uh, the fusion. Like uh, uh, rather than simply combination, uh, they need a all-round fusion. So this uh, shift can be termed as from mechanical integration to the organic fusion, uh, which uh, incorporates all broadest possible meaning of the. Uh, these two building block characters, Chun and Min. So, Ko Sefang uh, argues that military civil relations in China can be defined as a fish and water relationship, and which is like plus and uh, uh, blood relationship, which is very close relationship. And uh, it is a means uh, military civil uh, integration is a major for the party to accelerate the process of socialist modernization and provide the fundamental basis for realizing a prosperous country and strong military. So Ken and Viera has taken a neoclassical framework and termed civil military integration as a comprehensive strategy for the mobilization and extraction. So according to them, the major factor responsible for the military civil fusion are like the domestic factor of rapid progress in the emerging technology leading to the new quality of mobilization and systematic factor of the increasing strategic competition between US and China. So uh, during uh, 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 Mao's pe uh, period, the civil military uh, 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 integration can be like, uh, we can uh, trace the third fr uh, front movement and its legacy. So third fr uh, front movement aimed for creating a defense infrastructure in remote area and Mao decision to defense infrastructure in, in isolated area arised from the geopolitical concern of US pre presence in Vietnam war and in addition with uh, Sino-Soviet border conflict in 1969. So therefore, Mao transferred technology from existing industrial fa facilities in urban center to develop defense industrial base in strategically secure remote area. Uh, and this is considered as one of the classic example how like uh, economic consideration was not major factor in uh, this planning. So in during this period from 1960 to 1980s, China invested around uh, 200 billion yuan in the third front region. So this uh, period, Mao's period, created a base for tongue shopping uh, for the commercialization of the defense industry. So 
so tang xiaoping shifted this focus from third front for commercialization in terms of uh, civil military integration this can be termed as a spin off strategy where government is promoting uh, uh, their uh, military uh, facilities to for a com, uh, for a civilian good so this uh, uh, strategy has been termed as a turning spots into mar market share where like you are turning your military assets into market share so he also established commission for science technology and industry uh, for national De defense in 1983 so defense industries were opened uh, uh, like most uh, today uh, some of the prominent uh, civilian enterprises are are the earlier where defense industry opened during that period uh, so this greater involvement in the commercial operation of the pla has led to the increased uh, corruption in the uh, military so jiang zemin ordered the uh, ordered the pla to divest from the business activity in 1998 but he didn't uh, uh, like uh, stopped all commercial activities uh, he continued the successful uh, uh, he continued it for the successful uh, military firms to continue with the uh, with their um, commercial activities so since 1990s uh, uh, we have seen the process of reforms and integration in china in which uh, organizational and operational uh, measures were taken uh, in the second half of uh, 2000s china started prioritizing the uh, for the establishment of high end research facilities and basic research center at the defense and national level at the 17th party congress in 2007 hu uh, xintao proposed Uh, the concept of military civil fusion uh, uh, path with chinese characteristics in his central work uh, report of government in 2008 wen chiapa uh, also mentioned his objective of china innovation plan as a creation of national level in engineering center state laboratories and enterprise oriented innovation center so who sin tao report uh, at the 18th party congress also uh, calls for continued military and civilian integration with chinese characteristics to achieve the goal of uh, prosperity and strong armed force so uh, commission uh, constant was uh, issued like uh, uh, defense uh, mlp medium and long term science and technology plan in 2007 uh, in which uh, the um, basic aim was for uh, uh, shuchu uh, changjing uh, means uh, uh, which can be translated roughly as a indigenous innovation or independent innovation in that plan major objective was for like uh, promoting corporatization of research and develop uh, r and d and in that it was like uh, it was aimed to aim for like uh, uh, we should have a uh, uh, 2 point around uh, uh, china should achieve uh, 2.5% of their uh, Uh, gross expenditure on uh, research and development so in 2019 uh, china achieved uh, around 2004 uh, and uh, china uh, moved uh, from uh, to 29th place in 2007 to 14th place in innovation index but if we go by the definition of oecd so base uh, research constitute like basic research uh, applied research and fund, uh, in that uh, what we can see uh, that uh, uh, china share of basic research uh, was stagnant around uh, 5 to 6% during this 2007 to 2019 period uh, 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 for uk and us this was around like uh, uh, this was around like for us it was uh, 18.6% and uk it was 18.6% and us it was around 16.6% in 2018 so the so there was uh, what we can see there was over spending on the uh, uh, over spending of r and d on the uh, experimental portion but basic research and applied uh, basic research remained stagnant so also the this uh, can have negative impact on the long term prospects for scientific and economic development if you are only focusing on uh, like applied part not on basic part so uh, also policy of commercialization of r&d may have adversely impact and have uh, affected the development of basic research as many private uh, companies uh, has reported varying numbers for taking advantage of government incentives so this is a uh, uh, graph uh, prepared by stone and 
now uh, so they have uh, highlighted how in 2006 what i have just discussed how 2006 uh, aim was to increase uh, increase uh, their mlp aim for uh, like increasing their uh, gross expenditure on uh, rnd and uh, uh, increase up to two, uh, two point and how this graphs is also showing that how like uh, sunanka observed that how party state has uh, always acted as a, as a driver and central leadership facilitated uh, the policy measures for uh, military civil integration and also uh, the five year plans act as a vehicle for uh, implementing this plan so so uh, uh, what we can see that organizational uh, developments have over the period organizational development has taken place in 1998 uh, general armament department created uh, like uh, civil in uh, civil military integration promotion department was created in uh, 2008 so uh, saoyang uh, categorized the civil military uh, integration of different periods such as uh, mao's period as a military Mr. Pranath, sorry to interrupt you have 3 minutes left thank you okay okay i'm finishing so uh, he has uh, from consideration to the integration so i'll uh, go through these slides so Xi Jinping, so uh, basically uh, this paper tries to explain that uh, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, policy of military civil fusion is not new. There is a historical continuity. So Xi Jinping, but however, he was dissatisfied with the pro process. So uh, he uh, called for from early fusion to the deep fusion. Like in 2015, uh, he has made military civil fusion as a national strategy. He also uh, established the CMCDC Central Commission for Integration of Military and Civilian Development, and uh, we have seen different plan like uh, China's 13th uh, uh, five-year plan. So, based on like different literature, available literature on military civil fusion, uh, Alex Stone and Peter Woods from uh, uh, China Air, Air, Air Space Institute, they have like. Uh, uh, they have uh, de uh, like defined uh, uh, civil military fusion in these three terms the full element is about types of resources that will be shared in the civil military fusion these are uh, types of like resources here services personnel and facilities multi domain is about like domains priority domains from manufacturing science and technology educational to the security domains of maritime space and cyber space uh, nascent technology to the going on and this is high return is the expected uh, return um, that uh, Chinese leadership uh, is uh, expecting uh, from this military civil uh, fusion strategy. So uh, Xiang Luming uh, is one of the major uh, uh, architect of this policy. So the ro role of Xi Jinping uh, promoting MCF can be located in the setting priorities and coordinating and uh, so uh, uh, integrating with different plans like artificial uh, intelligence and uh, five-year plan. So in conclusion, what we can say that the role of Xi Jinping in promoting MCF can be uh, seen as a, in terms of both continued legacy and changes. Uh, however, there is financial innovation in the market diversification for uh, CMI is considered one as the critical challenge. Second challenge uh, is opic working culture of the military bureaucracy will be crucial for implementing the program. Third, that uh, reports on China diverting civilian uh, collaborating research to the defense sector has led to countermeasures from US such as expanding export entity list up to six, 600 in August 22. So this measure can uh, impact the progress of MCF. Overall, the ability of uh, ability to take organizational reforms in the Code PLA's interest areas is a major push forward for the MCF and a crucial achievement of the Xi Jinping. Thank you and welcome for your questions. Thank you, Prahlad. Uh, I'm not sure if Professor Datta is still connected with us. Uh, uh, he is here, I think. He's, he's here. Professor Datta, yes. are you there? I see him in the His audio is not connected, it seems. Okay. Uh, may I request Pahi to step in and take charge of this session? 
Um, but meanwhile, I think we can start with the discussants. Yeah. Pahi, are you there? Yes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. I'm there. Can you please take charge of this session? Professor Datta is unable to join with the audio. Okay. Thank okay. you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I I hope he gets in. <laughs> Am I audible? Am yes, I audible? you are. Yes, you are. Okay. Uh, thank you all. Um, uh, I think we, without further ado, I'd like to uh, request uh, the discussant to uh, please uh, give her comments. Professor uh, Gupta, if you are uh, there. Hi, Pahi. Professor Gupta, hi. And thank you for uh, inviting me to the event. And um, so I'm discussing one of the papers, which is uh, Priyanka's paper. So I'll be speaking about Priyanka's paper. Um, so uh, the idea of the paper is fairly compelling, which is um, to look at uh, what are the specific tropes in public facing uh, opinion and writing from China about India. I think um, it's a useful area of investigation if approached through, through the relationship between public opinion and public policy making. In this case, China's policy towards India. Um, and uh, while looking at this relationship with regard to China, one must keep in mind the specific institutional context of public policy making and the role of public opinion in this process. Um, while the Chinese institutional spaces and processes of foreign policy are not um, formally open to participative engagement by the people, public opinion today plays an important uh, role in foreign policy making. So the, um, the specific uh, discourse that, uh, that Priyanka is being, bringing, bringing to our attention is an important discourse to pay attention to. Um, so what is the gist of the paper is that there is, uh, there is this uh, trope of arcuism uh, being used to refer to India. Uh, and India's uh, provocative behavior vis-a-vis uh, -vis China is uh, being uh, explained by um, referring to the genealogy of arcuism as India's claiming a moral victory through this, right? So um, my um, comments uh, on this paper are in the nature of uh, Asking Priyanka to go beyond what she has done in the specific, what she has done in the uh, paper that has been given to me. So, Priyanka, I would like you to ask questions about who is the audience for this kind of an image? Is it India or is it a domestic Chinese audience or is it both? Uh, another question, I think, uh, which um, in which dire direction of which you should you should take this paper is that can public facing policy analysis like the things that you are reading. Can it be then considered a signaling exercise for India? And I think in this context, uh, it would be very useful for Priyanka to interview some of the former ambassadors, many of whom are part of you know, this event, to get an understanding of um, whether this is a signaling exercise and whether this kind of a signaling exercise has a role to play in actual foreign policy making, or is it largely dismissed as performance? Um, as far as the actual writing of the paper goes, um, there's a very large section in the paper, which is a general commentary on Lushun. Um, it, uh, in fact, most of the paper is that. And I don't think that serves the central thesis of the paper. It displays uh, Priyanka's familiarity with Lushun's work and impact um, in China as a literary figure, but it doesn't quite establish the connection that the paper is trying to make with foreign policy. Um, um, a couple of other things which I think um, um, need attention if this is to this is to move beyond what is already there in the paper is that there are very broad um, unsubstantiated, um, unsubstantiated statements about the RQ narrative being very widely used in IR to refer to China. There is references provided to support this claim. And um, the specific quotations that Priyanka used today in the presentation are not there in the Paper. So I think she should she should weave that in in a much more uh, robust manner, and uh, I think if you do this, then the paper can move beyond what 
it currently is, which is largely an opinion based piece. piece. And uh, it has it has to it has to move beyond that. And I hope these comments will be helpful in doing that. Thank you, thank you, ma'am, for the comments. Priyanka, if you'd like your comments, uh, if you'd like your paper back with the comments, I can send it back and you can take a look at them. Thank uh, you, thank you, thank you. Uh, do Priyanka, do you have uh, anything to say uh, about the comments made by the discussant? Um, Would you like to respond to your co the comments? Um, uh, yes. I think Akhil is still trying to get in, but meanwhile we can hear Priyanka out and. Uh, if she ha okay, wants to respond to uh, Professor Gupta's comments. Uh, yes, uh, ma'am has raised like, is it for India or both for China, like this comments. Uh, so I would like to say earlier, China was using this RQ for itself. But after uh, like uh, 1980s, especially, uh, they have stopped using it for uh, herself, but they are using uh, for others. Uh, especially they right now they are using it for uh, in the context of uh, india and uh, i have not seen like any other commentaries like they are using this rq uh, or a special victory uh, other than uh, india they are using they are not using for other country so they are uh, my, my comment to you is who is this intended for they are writing about india but who is who is this writing who is the audience for this writing are they writing for example uh, you mentioned today that you've read it in chinese in your paper it's not even clear whether you've read, read all this in english or in chinese uh so yes ma'am i just if yeah it's in chinese then it's a domestic constituency if it's in english then it's a broader constituency right and i think that's an important question who is this intended for so you should you should establish that firmly uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I would like to like the commentaries today. I've spoke in the uh, like while discussing uh, my paper. So I just read it uh, like uh, yesterday only. Like uh, from uh, and then I just uh, try, I wanted to include some recent comments. Like what are their comments uh, on uh, like recent uh, the, like the paper? So I just wanted to uh, include it, the recent developments, like how they are using this special victory in the recent context of India. So like this. Uh, so actually, uh, I just uh, want to say like uh, this uh, uh, acu and uh, this acquism or the special victory, they are particularly uh, trying to tell uh, India, like uh, they are targeting it to the like, this is the mindset, like how uh, they're targeting it to the, of course, uh, to the foreign policy. Like, how do I think about you? Like, if you are saying you ask you, so how do I think? Like, ask you is indolent, is unhygienic, like I don't give value. So if Chinese competitors are saying this, they, it means that they're targeting to India. Like, I don't give a, I don't give uh, so much value to you. So in this sense, uh, like, of course, they're targeting to India uh, and uh, like they don't understand, uh, they don't give much value to India. So in this context, yeah. Sure, thanks. Uh, Professor Gupta, would you like to comment on uh, the two papers? Do you have anything? Uh, well, I think uh, I'm, I'm not the discussion for those papers, but uh, just on the basis of what I've heard today, I think Cherry's paper is very well organized and uh, it's a great uh, literary view of the existing literature. And I think uh, her conclusions are uh, fairly well substantiated. Um, my only um, um, thought when I was listening to her was that beyond this work, what is the useful question what one could ask about the uh, kind of uh, um, nature of uh, Primary yeah, education, yeah. And it, relating it with, uh, with nationalism in China, and I think uh, the specific concept of suture that Cherry uses is the most useful to develop this further. So I think if if she could develop on the suture concept more, on now not just within primary education, how this is beginning to define the relationships even between minority communities and the Han community 
in China. That would be very useful. Um, as far as Prahlad's paper goes, uh, I enjoyed listening to it. I think it's uh, well grounded. Uh, it has a good sense of where it is going. Um, uh, at the end, I think uh, Prahlad could ask himself the question of, I have got all of this material and I've presented the relationship between the civil and the military. Now, what is it that I can, what is a question I can answer with this? Why is this useful to do? So these were my thoughts when I was listening to the other two. Thank you, Professor Gupta. I think I heard uh, Professor Akhil is trying to get in. Rija, can you check that? Yes, yes. Uh, uh, Professor Datta, I think you can un unmute yes, yourself. Yes, I, I have yes, joined. Yes, uh, yes. Uh, so since you have Pelosi, you know, uh, it was extremely unusual that uh, it happens Over like this. Yes. Probably the internet uh, is completely down here, therefore. Uh, uh, so I think uh, both Shota uh, and uh, Hemant have spoken, or Hemant is yet to speak? No, sir. Professor Hemant is yet to speak. Uh... OK. So let uh, uh, Professor Hemant speak first, uh, give his comments. OK. Um, uh, shall I come in? Yeah, yeah, please. Okay, uh, thank you, Professor Datta. Um, and thank you, Professor Saikia, uh, also. Um, I'm supposed to discuss the remaining two papers uh, after Sonika has discussed the first paper. Uh, uh, since I have only a few minutes, let me be very quick and come straight to the point. Um, I think my, uh, I begin by complimenting both the organizers uh, and the paper presenters because it's a wonderful uh, theme, China uh, Discourse and Praxis. And I think all the three papers uh, sit very comfortably under the theme. So it's a very good uh, synchronizing of uh, theme as well as the papers. Uh, and my guess is that, that the theme was <laughs> determined after the papers were read and organized to be put together. So whichever way, both uh, I think are complementary to each other. So that's my first observation. And then coming to the papers, uh, uh, I shall uh, give uh, the compliments to the two presenters wherever they deserve. And also I shall be slightly critical also wherever I feel the need to. Uh, both the papers, uh, uh, I think are very uh, original, like the earlier first paper also. All the three papers have very original theme as the beginning of the research for the young scholars. So that's a very, very uh, um, welcoming aspect. Uh, especially the paper by Ms. Uh, <clears throat> Cherry is very exhaustive, uh, I must say that, uh, in its research, and it also is uh, if I may use the word breathtaking in its uh, scope and range. Uh, so that's again a very, very uh, interesting aspect of the paper. And so is uh, Prahlad's paper also. Very interesting original uh, theme of focusing on MCF uh, under she, um, because we haven't seen uh, much of writings in the literature on China, generally on these themes. So that's a, that's a plus. Uh, now, very quickly, uh, coming to some of the critical comments. Um, I, I, uh, you know, the one problem which I see with uh, many uh, papers or researches, especially in India, uh, on China, is that when you, when you look at the bibliography or when you look at the references, one, one feels that there is a mismatch between the methodology and framework and the actual research presented uh, under the topic in that paper. And uh, I mean, I always tell my students who work under me uh, for research, MPhil or PhD, or when I take the research methodology class, that um, uh, you, you know, there, there is a Chinese saying also, 
uh, it is uh, non yuan page basically it can be roughly translated as uh, moving in the wrong direction i mean it's a it's a chang yu push as you know china has uh, most of the idioms based on stories so this particular idiom uh, nan yuan <clears throat> page comes from a story of three kingdom period where a traveler is going in one direction uh, and he has all the wisdom and the wherewithals etc but he is actually moving further away from the destination and that is what i call methodology and uh, i'll briefly uh, comment on why i am saying this thing in the context of the two papers i am discussing i mean for, for example first paper uh, cherry's paper uh, is focus is on ideal citizen i mean it's a very interesting theme but when you look at china or the chinese reality or the communist china as she has mentioned several times in the paper and giving the very exhaustive background of uh, marxism and soviet union lenin and then bringing in althusser etc i mean if you look at china or socialism or socialist state i mean the focus has always been on i mean in china's case also on model uh, communist or new socialist man and not too much focus on citizen i mean as she herself said it during the presentation also very of the three categories she laid out uh, people nationals and citizen and she said that citizens is far more far less significant compared to the other two categories so uh, methodologically also i mean where when and where the emphasis shifts in china from uh, from a good model worker or model communist to good citizen i mean that's uh, i think a very important methodological proposition uh, which is not uh, discussed at all in the paper i will also uh, suggest if she hasn't looked at uh, a reference which is a paper which is a thesis actually in the university of british columbia in 2014 and the title is uh, from lushun's save the children to mao's the world is yours children's literature in china from 1920s to 1960s it is by uh, evagina uh, stroganova uh, a phd scholar who submitted a thesis in the university of british columbia in 2014 and that will uh, be very helpful i think in this uh, theme and in this context um, um i mean elsewhere uh, i'm mean, throughout the paper uh, the focus is actually other than the songs uh, very beautiful songs some songs and um, uh, other literature i mean where is one driving uh, what is one driving at that that is not very clear to me in the paper and it, as i said it's very exhaustive paper it brings to you a whole lot of uh, theoretical range in the discussion but what what is the main point main theme of the paper that focus i do not get uh, i have one question also for both pralad and uh, cherry but i think since i have very little time i will save the questions for the question and answer session to make double use of my <laughs> participation here and i'll quickly move on to uh, the last paper and as i said uh, very interesting uh, paper very original paper very exhaustive uh, paper but at the same time uh, the focus is somewhere uh, i think uh, diluted when you are discussing under the influence of uh, maybe too much of uh, western literature or foreign discourse uh, on the subject uh, i usually my students uh, can testify that i usually do not begin my discussions or end my discussions by referring to the mainstream western sources from the western academia or 
media, etc. But today I will do that because uh, in this, in the context of the discussion we are having, last year in May uh, there was a very interesting article uh, in the Harvard Business Review, and the title of the article is "What Was the West? What the West Gets Wrong About China?" Okay, uh, I'll not go into the details. Uh, and then a uh, couple of years ago, in the Economist magazine, there was another similar article. The title was How the West Got China Wrong. I mean, the conclusion of both the Harvard Business Review and the Economist uh, article was basically that we thought uh, when China started opening up, that China will become a democratic or liberal polity, etc. And we proved ourselves wrong, and that was not to be. So therefore, uh, I say that especially when we are discussing China or researching China, methodology and framework is very important. And Prahlad, for example, uh, I'll, because of shortage of time, I'll just point out one thing, uh, and, and that, draw, that drew my attention. Uh, and I've been thinking about that actually on page 10, I think somewhere he mentions uh, quoting another scholar or another article which appeared in the diplomat in 2017. Prahlad has used a term or phrase, which is the Marxist military theory. Now, I found it very interesting because I've never heard of any such thing uh, before. But Pilar does not discuss that uh, at all. He just mentions that. And whatever little I know about the Marxist military theory, I mean, there is no such Marxist military theory in my understanding. And I said, I said I'm open to learning and correct, correcting myself. But there is definitely a lot of debate on, especially beginning with Lenin, on the uh, revolutionary military strategy, which uh, uh, later on was picked up by a lot of uh, Western Marxist scholars. Uh, uh, even, uh, I mean, the lead was taken by Foucault uh, in particular. And this Lenin's military strategy, strategy or revolutionary strategy and the later discussions which followed were actually to either negate or reject the revolution, Marxist revolutionary strategy or the Marxist revolutionary uh, uh, plan altogether. So it was a negation of that. So I really don't know. I would like to understand and learn more that in what context and with what purpose uh, you have used the term Marxist military theory. Uh, that, that, that's it. And uh, I have one question each for both of you, which I will ask in the question and answer session. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, we will now move to the question and answer session. There are two questions, okay. uh, both from Anurag Khan, one addressed to Cherry Hitkari and one to Pralat Kumar. I'll read out question for Cherry first. In your research, you have also focused on how children, especially those hailing from ethnic groups like Tibetans and Uyghurs, respond to these songs, specifically those claiming China as, a one, as one large family. So that is the question to Cherry. And question to Anurag. A uh, question from Anurag to uh, Mr. Prahlad. Has the traditional Chinese attitude of disdain towards the military rooted in Confucian philosophy affected the civilian military relations in any manner? Given that as per recent US military study of PLA, a drawback of the Chinese military is that less number of personnel as well as eager youth are, will, are willing to join the army and there are a lack of aspirations for promotion in the existing PLA command structure. So what are your comments on that? So these are the two questions that we have from the chat. And then, of course, uh, Professor Hemant has his own questions. So if you could just answer these two. Uh, Ms. Cherry, could you go ahead? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, so about this question, I would say that the focus of uh, songs since the very beginning from Mao to Xi Jinping has been uh, ethnic uh, integration, national integration in terms of 
you know, ethnic integration. It has received a renewed focus under Xi Jinping. We do not really know of the responses as such from ethnic minorities because, I mean, of course, as Louis also said, also, you know, in his words, there's a very strong repressive state apparatus which functions in policing such discourses. But what I would say is that, uh, first of all, there is, of course, an attempt to ideologically mold children from the very beginning to, for instance, uh, certain songs which appear under Xi Jinping, the, their focus is to ideologically mold uh, the everyone to show that you know, your your personal destiny is linked to that of the nation. And there's nothing that you can do about it. Your a region, wherever you hail from, is an integral part of China, and this will remain so. There is not going to be any change in the status quo. So your destiny is inevitably linked to that of the nation. So in order to prosper, your, you know, for your own prosperity, you have to contribute to national uh, development. And also uh, that uh, you know, as uh, the national national integration is a collective duty. So it, it, your own aspirations and everything in identity has to be subdued to the larger identity of being a Chinese uh, national. Uh, then I, I would say that, but uh, it does, I mean, of course, come in conflict with individual identities because as people grow up, they come into touch with different realities that surround us. So it I think inevitably leads to the largest struggle between the process of learning and unlearning where, you know, you make sense of the reality and understand that whatever you have been taught till now, somewhere is not really, you know, uh, in line with what uh, it, exactly of how things should be. But again, the question arises, how far would they come to the fore? Because there's a very strong policing and surveillance system. So uh, in terms of expressions, I do not think we would have as such uh, expression, protest, I mean, protest or expressions of where we get to know how people from the ethnic minorities react to this one large family narrative. Uh, thank you, Sherry. Uh, now, Mr. Pralhad, could you please go ahead with your response? Okay, thank you. Uh, for Anurag, uh, like uh, uh, party, or, uh, party always promotes the Confucius idea uh, for a close relationship, like uh, they always promote idea of fish and water relationship or flesh and water, that uh, flesh and blood relationship. That uh, when you look at the civil military relationship, China, you can't apply the framework of a democratic or Western world that uh, uh, separates a totally separate institutional separation or can cannot be part of that. So that Confucius uh, or idea of close relationship between uh, military and people, uh, military and people, is a uh, important pillar of understanding civil military relationship in China. Uh, about the about the less number of personal and, and lack of aspiration. So less number of personal and lack of aspiration two different things. Uh, less number of personal that a party is deliberating uh, demobilizing the military and there uh, if you go through uh, over. A defense white paper over the period, uh, they are uh, they just uh, after the Gulf War they want in uh, informatized warfare or intelligent warfare. There uh, they want less number uh, but more efficient military. That's why a military uh, civil fusion and uh, uh, less number of, of military informatized military or applying ICT. They are uh, we, uh, aiming for transforming military for a modern uh, warfare. About uh, human such remark. Uh, so uh, Marxist, uh, as I can, uh, I have also uh, have to look in detail uh, I, how uh, in what context I have referred. But as I can recollect, uh, recollect right now that uh, uh, Marxist uh, Marxist theory was uh, referred in the context of uh, like uh, uh, explaining a uh, uh, proletarian uh, peasant model of uh, um, army, where Mao emphasized. Like uh, it is referred, uh, I have referred uh, Zhao Yang uh, for like uh, how that uh, he contends that civil military relations can be understood by uh, like understand by the culture uh, like mixed so a uh, soldier and uh, peasant model like uh, where uh, where uh, this. Uh, uh, economic work and uh, military work can't be separated and uh, war and violence is considered as a means for social change so this is referred in the context of understanding the like uh, how uh, uh, notion of people's wars and uh, protected warfare uh, uh, are rooted in that uh, uh, 
Marxist theory. Thank you, Mr. Pralad. I would now request Professor Adlaka to proceed with his questions. Um, thank you, Nishant. Uh, since you're running out of time, uh, I'll quickly ask my very brief questions to each uh, Cherry and Pralad. If there is no time to reply, they can note down the questions and have the discussion sometime later on. Um, uh, but first, a quick observation to Cherry also that uh, I, uh, I mean, to both of them, but especially to Cherry, that I think it will help you balance your uh, narrative uh, if you have more uh, use of Chinese sources, which is, I think, uh, lacking. Uh, now, the question to Cherry is, as I mentioned earlier also, that uh, you haven't actually uh, looked at uh, this emphasis shifting from uh, how to be a good communist to how to be a good citizen. I mean, if you can uh, discuss that uh, more elaboratively, it will help us understand what happens in China post Mao and also uh, post 49, et cetera, et cetera, because very little has been uh, available on this good citizenship in a socialist uh, uh, country. So that's a question for you. And for Prahlad, um, uh, uh, Prahlad earlier I forgot to mention that uh, you have said that MCF uh, uh, is actually not something new and initiated by Xi Jinping, but definitely Xi Jinping has injected a new life into the whole concept. And uh, But my basic uh, point is, uh, you have not discussed uh, what is the purpose? What is the main purpose? I mean, how do you distinguish between, between CMI and MCF? I mean, CMI, you know, you have written that, is practiced in America also. And uh, uh, I mean, one, uh, you have referred to uh, Peter Wood and uh, Alex Stone and all that. Uh, they have also discussed it at length. And from their writings only, I picked up this thing that the MCF, uh, I mean, in China's case in particular, the MCF is uh, very different from other societies in which you have mentioned that military and civil, et cetera, et cetera, cooperation. But in China's case, it's very different because in China, this whole MCF, the main purpose is to strengthen and uh, make solid the PLA, now, which is very strikingly different from all other uh, societies, what we see. So my question to you is, uh, what is China aiming at by implementing MCF to strengthen PLA? I mean, is it is it to uh, further consolidate the rule of the CPC in China? Or is it aimed at winning foreign wars? I mean, if it is a second, then it has a very special relevance for us, especially in the context of Galwan and also now after the 20th party Congress, the dragon threat becoming more and more. So this is my question to you. Thank you. Uh, before the participants say anything, I would like to uh, quickly raise a question from Dr. Pahi Saikia. The question is for Priyanka. Somewhere you mentioned that China uses the IR discourse with a realist ambition. What is the evidence of your claims uh, that you make in your paper on the political discourse of RQ? Uh, I'm afraid we have very little to no time left for responses from the speakers. So if it is fine with the chair, I would request uh, Professor Datta to go ahead with his closing remarks. And I would request the speakers to okay, please thank you over the Pratt. questions and address them later. Thank you. Professor okay. Datta. Okay. Uh, I think we have, yeah, thank you very much. We have only two, three minutes left and uh, we cannot delay valedictory function. Uh, so thank you very much, and uh, I have been uh, in a way the absentee chairperson for the session, uh, thanks to the uh, internet disruption and so on and so forth. I think this has been a very, very enlightening session, uh, like all the previous sessions and all the three papers. Even though I couldn't listen to every speaker here, I had gone through the papers, I have read the papers. And as uh, has been uh, already pointed out by both the discussants, that the three people together you know, gives us a very comprehensive understanding about how does a regime sustain, how does a regime, you know, manufactures or creates its own legitimacy by using, you know, the folklore, using literature, 
using you know its own ideological apparatus and also uh, you know sustaining its military might and so on and so forth i think uh, china has been very unique and uh, you know in terms of uh, you know both manufacturing and sustaining its legitimacy because it has been successful in keeping together otherwise in a very contrasting forces like the market playing a very pivotal role in terms of bringing prosperity in economic terms but stay not declining as a western liberal notion state market relationship on the other hand party still playing the pivotal role in determining the what the citizens uh, think about and so on and so forth but remember our personal experience shows you know there's uh, you know there are some very interesting and unique kind of manifestations even of uh, the people even of the i think um, professor datta has dropped out again uh am i still audible to... am i audible yes sir yes sir, yeah. yes, yes sir you are <laughs> the final watch final watch when we visited china in 2017 there was a young guy uh, who was guiding us helping us uh, you know studying in university i was asking him a very simple question keeping in mind when we talk about mahatma when we talk about mahatma uh, every generation will have a lot of respect and every generation maybe every kid will have some understanding about gandhi i was asking him what is your understanding about mao and he said something very really interesting oh my parents have a lot of respect for him we have seen his portraits and photographs at home well on this that very interesting comment we lost professor datta again <laughs> <laughs> Uh, am i audible my final word. my my final word therefore when you look at china it's very unique it's very original in terms of reaching its uh, own legitimacy sustaining its own legitimacy despite theoretically having lot of contradictions i think the china's um, you know practices china china's discourse and practices gives up gives us lot of new insights even to understand the local politics or the national politics in the context of india with this words i conclude my remarks and thank you very much uh, for giving me this opportunity i think we are not in time okay thank you sir uh with this we come to a very fitting conclusion of scholar presentations at our 15th iccs we had three excellent uh, presentations in this session now we will be taking a very short break and coming back for our valedictory session so i'll request all the participants to please stay tuned we will be back very shortly thank you <laughs>